Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me tonight, along with my colleagues, for this patient webinar entitled Parsonage Turner Syndrome Diagnosis, Management, and Future Directions. I'd like to acknowledge the support of the HSS Educational Institute for making this webinar possible. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is just introduce myself, Daryl Snig, shown on the far left, as well as my colleagues. I'm the Director of Peripheral Nerve MRI and Radiologist at the Hospital for Special Surgery here in New York City. I work very closely with the team within the Center for Brachial Plexus and Traumatic Nerve Injury headed up by Drs. Wolf and Lee, who are both hand surgeons and world-renowned peripheral nerve surgeons as well. Uh, third or fourth, I should say, from the less, left is Dr. Joseph Feinberg, physiatrist in chief emeritus, uh, who we really rely on for all our electrodiagnostic testing for our patients, and my close colleague, Dr. Kenny Nawaka in radiology, who's an expert on peripheral nerve ultrasound. So the purpose of this webinar is to review the etiology or describe the etiology, diagnosis, and management of Parsons turner Syndrome. I'd like to somewhat raise awareness and offer any support to patients and their families who may be suffering with the syndrome. And on that note, I'd like to just begin an open dialogue. This is the first webinar related to Parsons turner Syndrome at HSS, and hopefully develop a network um, with you out there and any supporting family members and friends, again, who may be currently dealing with symptoms of Parsons Turner Syndrome. So how do we define Parsons Turner Syndrome? Well, the classic presentation is severe acute onset pain, often awakening the individual in the middle of the night or the morning, and is most typically the pain is centered over the shoulder girdle, over the lateral aspect of the arm here, the pain classically lasts about two to three weeks and then resolves, and it's followed by severe muscle weakness in the distribution of one or more nerves within the upper extremity. So how common is Parsons turner syndrome? Well, the National Organization for Rare Diseases, or NORD, reports an incidence of approximately one to three per 100,000 persons. Rare diseases, by definition, have incidences of less than or equal to 50 to 60 per 100,000 persons. We believe here that the lack of partial Turner syndrome recognition likely reduces the true incidence. And in fact, in a prospective study performed by Dr. Nens Van Alphen, a neurologist and a colleague of mine in the Netherlands, who, she reported an incidence of one in 1,000 in her community and surrounding towns making it a syndrome that is not rare. Male to female ratio is not insignificant of two to one. And the mean age of onset is 40 years old in the idiopathic form, that is there is no known cause, and 25 years old in the hereditary form, that is an inherited form that I'll touch upon in a little bit. So there are some challenges in making the diagnosis. The pain presentation may not always be classic, Major risk factors that I'll touch upon in a moment are, may not always be present, and weakness may be delayed. The question is, is it really delayed, or that the early weakness may go unnoticed as severe pain is the really troubling symptom that most patients have to deal with in the uh, initial onset of the syndrome. And there's this concept of a rare disease paradox. If there is a rare disease, then it can happen to my patient. Um, but I would argue, even if this is a rare disease, if you couple all the rare diseases together, there's an incidence of about one in 12 individuals who will deal with a rare disease of some sort. So there are a lot of rare diseases out there. So let's review some of the risk factors. These include strenuous activity. We see a lot of patients uh, who report antecedent event of strenuous activity. Um, however, we are an orthopedics hospital, and therefore we may see a greater proportion of these types of patients. Patients who have undergone recent surgery, recent infection, such as influenza, recent vaccination, childbirth, and as I mentioned, there may be a genetic predisposition. However, in about 50% of the cases, a patient is unable to report any antecedent event. The symptom just comes out of nowhere. So as I alluded to, there is a hereditary form of neuralgic amyotrophy. 
this is decidedly rare, and there is being a mutation that's being recognized in the septin 9 gene. Uh, however, in patients, even with uh, those uh, patients with family members who have uh, similar symptoms of the disease, this mutation is only found in 55% of cases. And the hereditary form is similar to the idiopathic form in terms, of, in terms of its presentation, but attacks tend to recur more frequently. So what are the causes of partial Turner syndrome? Well, in summary, we do not know. However, most experts believe that it is immune-mediated. So there's something that triggers our immune system uh, to cause a cascade of events that leads to the pain and weakness. Others believe that there might be a vasculitic component or some inflammation of the blood vessels or abnormal blood flow to the region. And this, I would argue, fits in best with the acute onset of pain. And finally, there might be a mechanical component. So is there some traction on the nerves or compression of the nerves that predispose them to developing the constrictions or abnormal findings on imaging and surgery that I will show you in a moment. So this is a busy slide, but I just wanted to provide a summary of the natural history according to some uh, larger series in, uh, in, in the literature. One is from Van Alphen, which she reported almost 250 patients, 200 of whom she followed for more than three years. Fortunately, in this series, only about 8% had full recovery. Mm -hmm. Two thirds had persistent pain and weakness and greater than 25% could not return to work. However, other, um, most other case series uh, describe a very good prognosis. In fact, in a series by Dr. Tsaris back in the 1970s, uh, Dr. Tsaris was a physician here, he reported overall excellent functional recovery. And a more recent series by Dr. Joseph Feinberg, who's joining us on today's webinar, um, in which he followed patients closely by EMG. 80% showed early regeneration at a mean time of six months, and 70% of patients showed almost complete recovery uh, less than a year. So what are the exams that we use to diagnose and, parse and monitor partial Turner syndrome? Well, these include most basic exam, a physical exam, um, uh, and we grade the muscle strength according to the British Medical Research Council, as shown on the chart on the right. Electromyography, it's also called a needle EMG. This involves the placement of small, thin needles in a muscle to record electrical activity. And this determines whether muscles are functioning normally and is able to monitor recovery of the nerve via the muscle. Thirdly is magnetic resonance neurography, and this is the focus of my own clinical and research practice. And magnetic resonance neurography simply refers to targeted techniques using the latest and best hardware and software to visualize peripheral nerves and detect any abnormalities within them. Ultrasound performed by my colleague, Dr. Nwaka, uses high frequency sound waves also to visualize nerves and muscles and other structures and these sound waves can produce images of structures within your body. So the question often arises, well, why image if sometimes the presentation is so classic? Well, I'd argue one is to rule out other possible causes as a potential extrinsic mass, that's a mass outside the nerve, albeit extremely rare, can assess abnormal function of the muscle uh, by the presence of an edema pattern or bright signal within the muscle, as shown on the figure on the top right, where we have abnormal signal in the brachialis muscle, is a muscle that is, flexes your arm and normal signal of the remaining muscles, and also to evaluate for hourglass-like nerve constrictions, as I'll describe in detail in a moment. So hourglass-like nerve constrictions have been seen on imaging in patients with partial Turner syndrome and have been confirmed surgically. Our group is particularly interested in studying these constrictions as we believe they may be a unique biomarker to diagnose and possibly monitor Parshner's Turner syndrome. One of our first papers collectively as a group was to describe an imaging finding of the nerve just proximal to the site of the constriction, which we so-called named the bullseye sign, which on imaging is depicted by concentric rings of high and low signal intensity, again, immediately proximal to the site of constriction. 
So now I'd like to review the most commonly involved nerves in partial nerve turner syndrome. And we'll start with the suprascapular nerve. The suprascapular nerve is a nerve that arises from the brachial plexus and innervates two rotator cuff muscles that are the supraspinatus and infraspinatus that are responsible for abduction or elevation of the shoulder and external rotation respectively. On the right here, we see an example of a patient with severe wasting of the infraspinatus or, and they're just surface landmarks of the infraspinatus and also more moderate wasting of the supraspinatus muscles. On MRI, we see edema patterns in the supraspinatus on your left and the middle image infraspinatus. And on the far right, we're able to, to, to show the nerve along its longitudinal extent going from the brachial plexus to the muscles involved. The nerve is demarcated by the brackets and the arrows are pointing to severe focal constrictions of the nerve. Another commonly involved nerve is a long thoracic nerve, also arising from the brachial plexus and innervating or supplying electrical impulses to the serratus anterior muscle. The serratus anterior is responsible for protraction and stabilization of the scapula. And in somebody with a deficient serratus anterior muscle, it may develop a winging of the scapula. Here on MRI, we see edema pattern of the serratus reflecting denervation of that muscle. And similar to the suprascapular nerve, we're able to demonstrate longitudinally the nerve and identify a severe focal constriction of that nerve. Third common nerve is the anterior interosseous nerve. This nerve supplies multiple muscles within the forearm. It's a motor nerve arising from the median nerve and it supplies muscles at, such as the flexor pollicis longus muscle responsible for flexion of the thumb and the flexor digitorum profundus muscle innervating the index finger. And this as shown on the top right allows one to oppose the thumb and index finger together to grasp something. And this is really critical in your everyday routine to button a shirt for example or pick up a coin. Um, the, the finding of a constriction in this particular nerve is particularly um, interesting or unusual, as here we do not have a constriction of the entire nerve itself, but only those fascicles or fascicular bundles corresponding to the AIN portion of the median nerve above the elbow. So I'll direct your attention to the figure on the bottom right. Here we have a topographical map of the expected arrangement of the fascicles of the median nerve. And as depicted by the pi portion of the chart in red is the anterior interosseous nerve, which assumes a posterior or posteromedial location. And you see on the corresponding MRI image, only those fascicles are bright. On the longitudinal image here on the far right, we see a severe focal constriction of the anterior interosseous fascicle of the median nerve. Less commonly involved nerves, but nerves that we do see rather routinely in our practice are the axillary nerve. This innervates the deltoid muscle, which comprises three heads, also responsible for working in, uh, with the supraspinatus to elevate the arm, and also innervates the teres minor muscle, which is, helps with external rotation of the arm. The radial nerve and its motor division, the posterior interosseous nerve, this is responsible for extension of the arm, uh, that is the triceps, and also extensors of the hand and fingers. Thirdly, the musculocutaneous nerve. Um, on the image of this patient on the left here, we see wasting of the brachialis muscle deep to the biceps muscle. And involvement of this nerve seems to be analogous to the situation I just described of the anterior interosseous nerve, where we don't see a constriction of the entire musculocutaneous nerve, but again, only those fascicles innervating the brachialis muscle, which is commonly denervated here on the MR image deep to the biceps muscle. And as you guys, as, as many of you know, they will, may be well aware, biceps and the brachialis is responsible for flexing the elbow and also for supination. Another nerve that can be involved is a phrenic nerve, and this is seen in about seven to eight percent of 
of percent of Parsons Turner syndrome patients, as reported by Van Alphen recently. I'll direct your attention to the chest X-ray in the right. Here we see, uh, with superimposed outlines by myself, of the the hemidiaphragm, which is elevated. The right hemidiaphragm should sit just slightly higher than the left hemidiaphragm here, but here it's markedly elevated because the phrenic nerve on the right is not providing innervation to the muscle, that is the diaphragm, that's responsible for moving our lungs up and down. And here we see severe focal constrictions of the phrenic nerve. So the question arises is how can a nerve twist or torse? It's a question that's bothered not only myself, but particularly Dr. Scott Wolf. Uh, as I mentioned, one of my close colleagues on the webinar here and, and an orthopedic surgeon. And he sent me, I remember, an email uh, late one night, and he had pulled this paper of an electro electron microscopic image of the arrangement of the epineurium relative to the longitudinal axis of the nerve. And as one can see here is the epineurium, which is the connective tissue scaffold, if you will, of the nerve, is not oriented necessarily parallel to the longitudinal axis of the nerve, but, uh, but oriented obliquely. And this is why we think the nerve has the appearance of twisting or torsing, as has been described. So what are the treatment options? Well, steroids are conventionally prescribed. This this has been shown to shorten duration of pain and possibly improve functional recovery. Other um, oral and intravenous medications, as opioids and NSAIDs, often are not helpful at reducing the severe initial pain. Physical therapy or occupational therapy may be most helpful, I would argue, after signs of neurological recovery. So in the early onset, they may not be of um, dramatic benefit because the muscles need these electrical impulses from the nerves to start firing, and then they can be trained and strengthened with physical therapy. Intravenous immunoglobulin um, has been proposed as having a possible benefit, particularly in patients with recurrent post-procedural attacks. Um, but to this date, there have been no randomized prospective trials, to my knowledge, uh, looking at how these uh, medications um, influence the course of the, the syndrome. And one of the reasons why there have been no studies is one, it's a rare disease, and actually it's the main, main reason, and it has been difficult for other investigators to prospectively enroll patients kind of earlier in onset when, the, when these medications are likely most effective. Lastly, um, for patients who have made no recovery or minimal recovery, um, the surgical neurolysis of the constrictions performed by expert nerve surgeons such as Dr. Wolf and Dr. Lee on this call um, can be performed. And uh, as an imager, um, I'm able to really target these uh, constrictions and to reduce the time during surgery and really the exposure. So Drs. Wolf and Lee can perform very, very targeted neurolysis of the constrictions of these nerves. And in our small subset of patients thus far, we've had overall very good outcomes. So what are some unknowns or questions about these hourglass constrictions I speak of? So one is how do these constrictions form? Are the number and or severity of the constrictions, that is, if you have a more mild or severe constriction, are these prognostic indicators of recovery? Why does partial internal syndrome only appear to primarily affect the upper extremity? What is the timing for any intervention, whether it be medical or surgical? And we're trying to uh, answer some of these questions through an observational study that's sponsored by the National Institutes of Health. This began in April of this year. Uh, the title of the study is Magnetic Resonance and Ultrasound Imaging Biomarkers for the Detection and Monitoring of Partial Turner Syndrome, for which I am the principal investigator and my uh, colleagues on this uh, webinar are co-investigators. And the main purpose of this uh, two-year study is to investigate the natural course, again, of imaging and also any blood markers that might suggest there be an inflammatory component for partial Turner syndrome. Um, so if any of you on the call are out there, if you're interested in learning more about the study in any capacity, uh, you can email my research assistant, Sophie Queller, or myself directly, as shown here. 
Um, so at this point, um, I thank you very much for your attention. Um, I, happy to open it up for any questions or comments. And I'm gonna turn uh, the control over to my research assistant, uh, Sophie Queller, um, who will moderate the next part of this webinar. Sophie? Uh, Dr. Smeek, I know you elaborated quite a bit about the role of MRI. Um, what, in your opinion, is the role of MRI in monitoring PTS over time? Sure. Um, thanks for that question, Sophie. So um, we typically um, monitor patients, and if Dr. Feinberg uh, can chime in here as well, we typically monitor patients with serial uh, EMGs and physical exams every three months. Um, but as part of the study I alluded to, um, we plan to monitor patients by imaging with MRI and ultrasound every three months as well. And again, this is to determine whether these constrictions that we almost invariably see in patients um, have any meaning in terms of prognostic recovery. So for example, we see in patients who have recovered that these constrictions go away or get better, then perhaps we can use this as a marker um, to facilitate a subsequent trial, a clinical trial, whether it be, again, a medical or surgical intervention. Um, because currently there is no um, uh, precise marker for partial Turner syndrome. The diagnos diagnosis typically comprises a patient's history. Uh, as I mentioned, the classic presentation of severe pain uh, and sudden onset followed by weakness and confirmed with electromyography showing severe uh, axonal degeneration um, or lack of nerve functioning. Thank you. Dr. Feinberg, um, we have a question for you. What are the diagnostic criteria for this condition? So, you know, it's my belief that the uh, EMG test or electrodiagnostic study is the definitive way to make the diagnosis um, many patients can be diagnosed with Parsons Turner syndrome based on pain, maybe delayed weakness, and a lot of things can cause that. Um, but there's some characteristic findings uh, based on my experience of doing this for many years uh, that I think make this fairly definitive or make it or rule it out. And that is uh, on the needle exam of the EMG test, I will see uh, very severe very definitive abnormal findings. So this is pretty much an all and phenomena, which makes it easy from an EMG perspective to diagnose. There's nothing, nothing subjective about that. The EMG finding must be definitive in showing what we call denervation, which implies that the muscle, the nerve to the muscle has completely uh, undergone degeneration. And sometimes this can be difficult to appreciate on physical exam because one or two muscles that have been completely denervated, uh, although they may be atrophic and may not be working, there's so many substitution patterns and ways that a patient can show some motion with other muscles compensating. So it can be very misleading on exam. So there are times where it looks like actually there's not paralysis of a certain muscle group because so much compensation. So the EMG test will show that that nerve has been completely knocked out and then there's certain other uh, findings on the EMG, which I won't get into. Uh, I'd be getting too much into the weeds, but it must be a very definitive finding of complete denervation of a branch or multiple branches of nerves uh, that come off the plexus, uh, and they don't have the pattern of, of nerve dysfunction that you see with a pinched nerve in the neck or other uh, more common problems. Thanks, Joe. I'm just, uh, I'm not sure if Sophie's seen, I, I see some other questions from our audience. Uh, one of them, um, I'll direct this to you, Joe, uh, is can syndrome on one side affect function of another over time? Where yeah. I, or maybe I can paraphrase if I understand the, uh, the uh, person's question is, can, can uh, dysfunction or weakness on one side affect the other side? Uh, yeah, okay. I was just trying to turn my camera on and it says my computer doesn't have a camera, which I don't think is true, but uh, maybe I'm better off not being seen. So, um, so two things in regards to that question. Uh, one, 
Uh, you can get bilateral involvement, uh, although my experience has been that's not, that's certainly less common. Uh, I probably see that in less than 10% cases, but you can get some bilateral symptoms and they may be unequal. So you could have one side that has diffuse symptoms and the other side may have milder or less involvement, less nerves involved. So, so they may feel symptoms on the other side. And if it's delayed, I've also had patients who develop Parsonage Turner syndrome on one side, and then for some other reason, a month or two later, developed it on the other side. So that's another reason if they had right. findings. And then the third is, um, you know, if it changes your biomechanics, it certainly can cause lead to other problems on the same side, more likely, because your the muscle's not working, it may alter your biomechanics, so you may start getting pain in other areas because your mechanics are altered. Now, should that affect the other side? I guess if it changed your body mechanics and how you did things, you could then develop other types of orthopedic problems. Great. Thanks, Joe. I have another question for you, Joe, from uh, one of our uh, people tuning in or patients. Are you aware of any proposed preventative treatment when a patient with Parson and Turner syndrome has surgery or another childbirth? Um, I'll just answer briefly myself. I'm not aware of any study specifically focusing on this, but um, I think that uh, some physicians might consider uh, empiric steroids prior um, to maybe an event that is known to trigger uh, previous partial Turner syndrome outcome. But I'll I'll let you answer, Joe. Yeah. So there are. This is a little I would say controversial in the literature. Um, so the recurrence of partial Turner syndrome is pretty rare uh, to have a second bout. Uh, I would say it's. I mean the literature. Is, may have it more common, but and I've seen as many cases as I think as any clinician out there has over the 30 years of my practice. So, uh, you know, so recurrences are so rare. Uh, a lot of times patients ask if they've had it from a vaccination, should they not have a vaccination? And I've always said, no, the risk for that is so low. I've never seen a patient who had a reaction of Parsonage Turner syndrome after vaccination and then had it again. The same thing, I've never seen it, well, we've seen them associated with uh, either normal delivery or C-sections. I've never seen someone have it a second time. So I think the risk factors are so low. That being said, if someone develops what seems like somewhat acute symptoms after another surgical procedure or after a C-section, there is some literature that says that you should start with IVIG. Uh, but, but if you're going to use IVIG, which I'm not really a big believer in intravenous gamma globulin that they use for autoimmune disorders. But if you were to do it, it needs to be done immediately. I don't think if it's done, you know, a few weeks down the road, it will, uh, that's my personal opinion, it will have an impact. I would say that's a little controversial. There will be those in the literature that disagree. So my general answer is generally no. If you just, if you're having a, if you had a C-section and you had a person that's trained syndrome and then you're gonna have another one, I would not say, I would never do it prophylactically but I would make those aware of the past history. And if you became symptomatic, then you might consider either a course of oral steroids, uh, maybe even intravenous steroids or else IVIG, but I wouldn't do it prophylactically. Another question Joe, for you is, can you explain, this is from, uh, again, another person who joined us. Thank you for the question. Can you explain why there are paresthesias that is surface numbness, tingling experience with this syndrome? Um, here, patients seem to describe that it was sporadic and uh, located in different places and highly variable, ranging from complete numbness to extreme sensitivity. Uh, Dr. Feinberg, could you explain why someone might experience these paresthesias? Yeah, so, you know, we generally believe Parsonage Turner syndrome usually involves motor nerves. And I would say that's by far the most common scenario, probably greater than 90%. That being said, we do see sensory symptoms. And since we don't know exactly the etiology, there's no reason why whatever is causing this in the motor nerves might not affect also the sensory nerves. So I would say that's probably one reason. Now, another explanation, and this is a little less scientific, is if you have any kind of response in a bundle of nerves and the motor nerves are predominantly affected, but there is any edema or changes there, it wouldn't surprise me that during the course of those edematous changes and any type of inflammation that occurs around those nerves, 
then it might trigger some sensory symptoms in the nearby sensory nerves. Although not having significant effect on the sensory nerves the way it does in the motor, but any localized inflammation within that nerve, if it had any sensory branches, might involve that. And right. again, maybe in certain scenarios, sensory nerves are involved. So those would be my two explanations why that would happen. Got it. Thank you, Joe. Great. So we have a few other questions here, um, one of which I think I, I can try to answer. What percentage of partial Turner syndrome cases show hourglass nerve constrictions on imaging? Um, we have an ongoing registry of patients, and uh, we imaged approximately 130 patients or so who have had a, a confirmed clinical diagnosis of partial Turner syndrome. And the vast, vast majority, I would say greater than 90%, um, particularly weren't able to see the nerve quite well, some nerves are smaller than others, were able to detect the presence of these intrinsic constrictions. Um, I see Dr. Lee there, uh, so I'm going to find uh, a question for you. Sure. Um, uh, Dr. Lee, maybe you could take this question. Um, are there any likely, are there any effective treatments available for individuals, not with severe, but mild to moderate chronic pain years after a partial Turner syndrome attack? Um, you know, there's a question if, if, um, if there's any sort of nerve compression that can be also involved. Um, but I think, you know, that would depend case by case and if they actually had any electric diagnostics that showed that. Um, also, if any selective um, nerve injections, you know, with um, an anesthetic would give pain relief. That could be helpful. Okay. Um, so, but overall, it's, Usually people don't have pain as much as weakness as long-term. Right. Okay. Um, so another question, um, a more surgically oriented question, how long would you recommend waiting before considering any type of surgical intervention such as a nerve transfer? Um, you know, I think it depends on the, on the case. If, um, if somebody had, um, let's say if they had actually some nerve, um, innervation going through and we were waiting and following that case and they were not getting better um, and it's been at least six months, probably closer to nine months. That'd be a case where you would have to make a decision if you're going to actually try to do a, um, a micro neurolysis, internal neurolysis, or to go to a nerve transfer, try to get function back. Got it. I think depending on, on the case and what you thought might, might be most helpful. Okay. Um, we found that the radial nerve microneurolysis cases have not done as well. And, you know, in that kind of case, I may um, choose something else. Great. Thanks. Okay. So I'll try to fill. There was another question. The question is, does long-term nerve constriction cause permanent deformation of the surrounding structures, such as the shoulder or ribs? Um, so to clarify, the constriction is of the nerve itself. So there's no mass that we see causing a constriction. The nerve is very small relative to the surrounding structures, such as the muscles and the bones. Um, so the nerve constriction, we think, we, we don't know whether it's a uh, direct cause, but likely is a cause of the um, lack of nerve functioning um, and muscle weakness. And the muscle weakness um, can cause atrophy in that region, um, but I wouldn't phrase it as permanent deformation. Okay, so another um, question is from the same individual. Is there any interest in developing a PTS patient registry that collects details about onset trigger, types of treatment, et cetera? Um, so I'd like to let you know that we do have an existing registry at our hospital. Um, if you have any further questions about that, you can email myself or Sophie Queller is on this call. Okay, there's another question here. Um, I give this to Dr. Feinberg, if you don't mind. Question is, I have scleroderma, lupus, and Sjogren's, and I had an episode of frozen shoulder on one side with severe pain a few years ago. Could this be Parsoner Turner syndrome? So the problem uh, with making a diagnosis, first, the frozen shoulder is, a, is not a neurological event. Um, and so if, if it were found, that the loss of shoulder motion were related to a nerve problem that was identified separately, then it's possible. But because uh, you have these underlying autoimmune disorders, 
uh, that in of, of themselves can cause mononeuropathies. Uh, it would be difficult if you had a mononeuropathy to determine or to, to, to be able to attribute it to Parsonage Turner syndrome. So more likely, so again, frozen shoulder is not a neurological issue, uh, but patients who have been sometimes diagnosed with frozen shoulder have been found to have uh, some type of suprascapular neuropathies, other neuropathies. And if they were to have that, then you'd have to fit the criteria and you'd have to have the widespread denervation. But again, with these autoimmune disorders, you can get mononeuropathies as well. So it would be a little more difficult to determine. But I think if you had complete denervation, as I have outlined what I think is necessary to make the diagnosis, then I probably would be comfortable in saying that that would be a case of Parsonage Turner syndrome. But again, that's not what frozen shoulder itself is by definition. Okay. All right, Joe, one other question for you. Uh, from the uh, member here, can you explain why partial Turner syndrome presents predominantly in the scapula? Um, and maybe let me just expound upon that. Why why do we see common abnormalities uh, involved in the scapula? Yeah, so so we don't know. So my there's no science right now to show why there should be a predilection in that area. Uh, I, I will speculate uh, on my own theory. Uh, and I believe that Parsonage Turner syndrome seems to affect nerves in certain areas, and that these are nerves that may have a predilection uh, for developing uh, decreased blood flow, what we call ischemic events, uh, just like you see with certain tendon problems, people who develop different tendinopathies. We know that a lot of these tendon problems, a lot of the tendons have areas where the blood flow is a little tenuous uh, to begin with. And so something that triggers or, or compromises that will affect that area. So it's my belief that the suprascapular nerve and the lothoracic two are the most common and maybe some of the other nerves have certain areas in the nerve tissue that are just a little more susceptible to ischemic events. Uh, the other possibility would be that uh, if there is an autoimmune phenomena, that there's something uh, in the antigens in that nerve tissue that's a little unique, but no one's ever shown that. But the reason why I would attack certain nerves in certain places commonly to me is more likely to be one of those two reasons. Okay. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lee, do you have anything to add on that um, or any other uh, particular comments around why you know we think that these nerves, I mean, in my mind, a lot of the nerves that are involved are derived from the C5 and C6 nerve roots. Um, you know, again, we mostly, where we predominantly see this syndrome in the upper extremity, predominantly affecting motor nerves. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts around that. Um, okay, let's move on here. Um, we have another uh, question. Um, and I'll open it up to Dr. Feinberg or Dr. Lee. And the question is, one significant recovery has occurred. Are there any lifestyle changes that one should adhere to? Or is it safe to assume that life can resume as it was pre parsonage Turner syndrome? Uh, I like, I'll give Steve, if Steve's still with us. No. Okay. Why don't you okay. go ahead, Joe? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's one of the most difficult questions. Should you, well, do you restrict your activities in the recovery phase? And if you fully recovered, do you restrict your activities uh, after you fully recovered? Uh, especially if it looked like there was some type of athletic event or a particular physical maneuver that you seem to associate with initial uh, onset of the disorder. So during the recovery phase, uh, the major you don't want to put excessive loads on a muscle when the nerve is recovering. Uh, so you want, to, you want to really limit your activities and do nothing uh, overly strenuous for that muscle group or that region. Um, and, you know, I think it's important since I think there may be a vascular issue to this that you always maintain well hydration. I think in, one, in this situation, being well hydrated is probably as important as it is in any disorder. Once you've fully recovered, 
since I've never seen patients have recurrent events going back to the sport, if they're a tennis player or they're a weightlifter, I just don't see them come and happening again. So that's kind of the sort of challenging and confusing thing about this. So I guess my, my answer really is uh, the only thing you don't want to do is overly uh, do things that are overly strenuous. Um, so we have seen athletes who've developed this when they've done extreme, extreme events. So if you've had an event, you know, and you're going to uh, run in a race and it's 95 degrees, maybe that's, that's the kind of time race you shouldn't be involved in. Or if you work out or do a lot of other activities, maybe cut back and do it to not the, the extent of degree. But other than that, I wouldn't make any major lifestyle change. Okay. Thank you, Joe. An answer. Um, Sorry, Carol, my, my Zoom uh, disconnected. Oh, no problem. Um, the question was, uh, are there any lifestyle modifications one should adhere to uh, following significant recovery? Um, and I think Joe was able to kind of answer that question. Let me ask you another question, Steve. Um, the question is, is there a way to definitively differentiate between a severe cervical radiculopathy and Parsons Turner syndrome if all nerves originate from the same root level of C5 to 6? Um, I mean, usually, um, you know, somebody who has a Parsons Turner is going to have one of the um, more terminal branch type neuropathies or even if they have one more than one nerve, it'll be something that's more terminal and you can see that versus the grouping of, you know, like a, a nerve root, like five, for instance. Um, I mean, I have um, heard of such cases, you know, where it's a nerve root level uh, Parsons Turner syndrome, but that's pretty rare. Um, and in that case, you would just see all the muscles that were involved were from that root and they weren't from a terminal branch. So I think you can tell by, you know, a very good, um, physical examination and a very good uh, and accurate EMG. Right, so I'll just say, I think, you know, EM, you know, there are reports in literature, we have seen um, some cases our, ourselves where there is a uh, patient develops partial Turner syndrome in the setting of maybe a pre-existing cervical radiculopathy, uh, whether that radiculopathy plays a role due to some stenosis at the foramen or not, in terms of triggering uh, cause of partial Turner syndrome, we don't know yet. Um, but we're typically able to distinguish the two entities uh, based on uh, what you said, Steve, based on a physical exam, a good EMG, um, and then on MRI, if there's any further questions, if we see, again, the presence of uh, constriction of one of or more of these nerves um, that may be involved, that would strongly suggest the uh, entity of partial Turner syndrome and uh, as a main culprit, even in patients with some degenerative changes in the cervical region. Okay, I'm gonna see if there's any other um, further questions. We do have another question. Um, is the recovery time still in the two to three year range? Um, this patient's two and a half years out and recovered about 25%. Um, I can try to field that, or maybe Joe, if you want to take a first stab as well. So again, the question is, what is the recovery time range? Um, and say a patient who's two and a half years out who's recovered about 25%, um, perhaps, you know, his or her question maybe, is there still room or uh, time for recovery yet? Yeah, so I think, and we have some pretty good uh, data uh, this isn't based just on my uh, intuitive thinking, but on, uh, on our data, that uh, you're going to get most of your neurologic recovery. And right now we'll take out of the picture uh, uh, considering a neurolysis, which may allow additional recovery if you haven't gotten it. But I think it's very rare to see any additional recovery beyond a year. And and this is why we have that magic window between six and nine months where we kind of start to make our decision then because you don't want to wait and let the muscle degenerate. So if there's no recovery by that time frame and you wait too late, the muscle will degenerate and you won't get it. You'll get hardly any recovery, if any at all. Um, but I think the natural recovery of the nerves uh, you're unlikely to see additional natural recovery of the nerve just regenerating much beyond a year. Now, you may get a little more strength back because after the nerve regenerates, 
the muscle, which has become atrophic, will then hypertrophy, the nerve will mature. So you may get other strength gains from that, but I don't expect them to be that dramatic. But as far as the neurological regeneration process goes, if you haven't, whatever you haven't seen by nine months to a year, you're probably not going to see much spontaneously beyond that. That's my opinion. Right. So Joe, there's a, you know, important point or important distinction I want to make is neurological recovery. That is electrical impulses going down the nerve spine, the muscle. And we talk about, you know, say clinical recovery or functional recovery. And as you alluded to, Joe, there may still be recovery, you know, perhaps a year or two out, but, um, particularly um, if there are additional muscles that can support the movement. So for example, uh, you know, we've seen professional athletes who may have severe a weakness in the deltoid with shoulder abduction, but they can use other muscles, build up those other muscles to compensate, such as the supraspinatus to perform similar actions. Would you agree with that, Joe, Steve? Yeah, I agree. I mean, they, they can compensate. And, um, and the other thing that can happen though, is that even if you get some nerve recovery to a muscle that's not vigorous over time, the muscle can also um, get better over time whether it's through hypertrophy or collateral sprouting. Right. Um, and so, you know, we don't understand the full mechanism, why they get better and better, but they do get better um, even past two years. Um, another side question, or um, I think point to make is that we don't know exactly how long uh, a muscle can wait before it can be recovered with a microneurolysis. It's different from a uh, transected nerve um, or a completely denervated nerve in a trauma situation. Um, in that situation, like a brachial plexus injury, you know, it's, um, it's about a year that you can do it, that it actually reaches the muscle. Right. But in a, um, in a plexus or I mean, a Parsons Turner type situation, the nerve is actually not disconnected. And so, you know, we've seen, um, some later cases, you know, that are past a year, 15 months, or even past that. And that a variable amount of EMG responses that have had some recovery, um, even though, like in a in a trauma type situation, you wouldn't you wouldn't think there'd be recovery. But the um, in these cases, it's different. Right, I agree with that. We have seen cases with patients many years out who have made recovery. Um, in fact, we have a participant here in the panel describing zero recovery in the first six months, um, slowly recovering left hand, and then full recovery at month eighteen. Um, so I, I think the jury is, is out and um, this may not, in terms of uh, recovery, may not follow the classic time period uh, for other severe ner nerve injuries, as you mentioned, the severe stretch injuries or, or laceration of the nerve, Steve. But, you know, Dal, if I may interject there. Uh, sure. So the point that Steve makes, I didn't want the, uh, the participants to be confused. So. I said the nerve is unlikely, if it hasn't, if you haven't seen recovery within a year, you're unlikely to get additional recovery spontaneously. But we have found, as Steve was pointing out, that when they do a neuro, microneurolysis, that they do can get recovery. So my belief is that if you, if it hasn't recovered in a year, that whatever's presenting, preventing recovery may be reversible, but at that point, it's not gonna happen without some type of intervention. So I think it's unlikely at about a year, if you haven't seen anything, you didn't get anything. But we have seen if they then undergo microneurolysis, it's almost as if a channel that was blocked now is opened. And as long as you do that within a certain time frame, uh, there's a chance you may get recovery. So I just want to clarify that. No, thanks, Joe. Uh, thanks for clarifying that. And uh, yeah, no, I agree. Okay. Um, well, I think we're towards the end here, wrapping up. I'm um, looking out for any additional questions um, that we could perhaps address. Um, but if there, are, if there are none, I'd just like to thank every, all our participants here who signed in. Uh, particularly like to thank, again, the HSS education staff um, for supporting this webinar. Uh, Drs. Uh, Steve Lee, uh, the Chief of Hand Surgery here at HSS, and Dr. Feinberg. Uh, our medical director in the Brachial Plexus Center here. So again, thank you uh, very much for uh, everyone's time tonight, and I wish you all a speedy recovery. Cheers.